Hello and welcome to Valinius Talk. This is the second season of the digital format and today's episode is focused on Poland's role in European and global affairs. My name is Velina Chakarova and I'm the director at the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy based in Vienna. My work includes research, consulting and lectures on the global system transformation and the geostrategy of global and regional actors based on geopolitics and realpolitik. This podcast is produced in partnership with Bharat Varta, India's leading podcast on politics, policy, and culture. My guest today is Jacek Bartuszak. Dr. Bartuszak is an expert in geopolitics and geostrategy and founder and owner of Strategy and Future. He is a senior analyst with Geopolitical Futures. In addition, he is a director of the War Games and Simulation Program of the Pulaski Foundation senior fellow at the Potomac Foundation in Washington, co-founder of Play of Battle, which prepares military simulations among many other institutional affiliations. Jacek Bartuszak graduated from the Faculty of Law and Administration at the University of Warsaw and is managing partner at a law firm dealing with business services since 2004. Dr. Bartuszak, welcome to this digital talk. It's a great pleasure having you with me this morning. Yeah, it's uh, first of all my pleasure to be uh, with you again, Evelina. Uh, hi, uh, hello to, to all listening. And thank you for uh, very much uh, to those who decided to join us uh, during the live stream. Uh, feel free to post your questions in the uh, YouTube channel or on Twitter because we are get, going to have a very, very exciting uh, 16 minutes uh, session. Um, First, I would like to stress that uh, Dr. Batushek has um, published uh, several important books, and the latest one is in co-authorship with Piotr Zichowicz, uh, and it's titled World War III is Coming. Will America Abandon Poland to Russia? And I want immediately to jump into this discussion about uh, the main features of Polish Jewish strategic thought uh, in the 21st century from your perspective. And also, I would like to directly ask you, what is your view on, on, on the question, will America abandon Poland to Russia? You know, the book that you're referring to was, um, uh, was written over the last year. And uh, within this book, we are describing the transformation of the global order with uh, some peculiarities, uh, you know, that are very characteristic uh, of Poland. Like, for example, what, what sort of force Poland should feel, why we entered the Second World War, uh, what it all, what is this China US thing all about, about strategic flows, the structure, superstructure of the world, world ocean against continent, all this, you know, the uh, economic dimension. Uh, so th 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 that book encompasses all aspects that creates and underlies the current world order that is under stress or even under distress, or some would claim and argue that it's already gone, by the way, and we are seeing the formation of the new one, the shaping of the new 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 order. And so, you know, the question is where Poland is and where Poland will be in this transition uh, period. Yeah, because we live in the crash zone, uh, Poles and other countries of Central and Eastern Europe, uh, as well as other countries of the world like Taiwan or uh, you know, or countries uh, th that are between the uh, defense perimeter of United States or within, or it's, uh, you know, to be, to be debated whether they're within or, you know, out of it. Uh, uh, it all, those, all those places will face turbulent times. And basically that's the book that is preparing us to understand why this is the case, why this is happening, what has occurred in the past to make it happen today, and uh, what might be the outcome? And uh, you know, that's basically that's basically our argument. Uh, but we go into details, of course. And of course, we don't want uh, to reveal 
too much about the book because the audience uh, should uh, actually buy the book and read it. But uh, still, of course, there is a, this uh, main um, question mark regarding the future role of Poland uh, in uh, the bilateral relationship with uh, the United States. Uh, Poland sees itself as this kind of very important Central European hub for American presence. So maybe you could reveal us at least this teaser as to how do you personally uh, regard the future um, role of Poland uh, in this uh, particular relationship with the United States, so the most important security guarantee, guarantee, so to say, for Central and Eastern Europe. I think that in Poland there is a major debate uh, underway now uh, concerning the uh, geostrategic choice that Poland is to face. Uh, the problem is that it will not be the Poland's choice by itself, but also the circumstances will choose for Poland. Uh, the division line is between, we call it the continental party, uh, that opts for the closer unification with, uh, with the European state, whatever that means, okay? Uh, within this European Union, ever closer union, ever closer bond, mm, and uh, between the New Atlantic uh, Party, uh, mostly the ruling government that has chosen some time ago to side with the US, whatever it takes, so to speak. Uh, it, uh, it chose, uh, as always, Poland uh, used to choice. We always preferred the uh, sea powers to anchor our relationship vis-a-vis -vis the continental threats. Uh, this is exactly what we did prior to the Second World War. And that was the option, uh, this time the same, uh, facing the threat from Russia, facing the, you know, the emerging China, challenge and also facing the growing pressure from the continent, from our Western uh, partners within the EU uh, against the agency of Poland, against you know, development of Poland on our own terms and so on. So the ruling party, Neo-Atlantic party, opted for that option, thinking that anchoring United States military presence, cooperation would create some new supply chains, new value chains, military presence, military cooperation, uh, you know, United States would increase its footprint in Europe, facing that you know all these continental challenges, both from Euro uh, emanating from Eurasia. Uh, so th th that's a division line. The problem is that as we speak on November two thousand twenty-one, in my personal opinion, all those two major options are futile. First of all, is because they will never be. A crystal model options uh, per se. First of all, after Nord Stream deal mid in, in the mid-year uh, 2021, the ruling party understood that the United States would not support, support the Neo-Atlantic world at all costs and the Pacific is more important. And Biden decided to, you know, to cede concessions to Germany and even to Russia, in our opinion, uh, uh, actually, uh, you know, crushing Poland's uh, vital interests, like energy independence and other interests as well. Uh, even Biden's talk about nuclear issues with the uh, Russian administration, Biden's signaling of the sole purpose, you know, was, uh, nu you know nuclear stance, um, what we see at the Pentagon, the transformation to the only Pacific force, the newest revelations of Elbridge Colby, that was the architect, one of the architects of the strategic posture 2018 and his book, Strategy of Denial, that the United States should even spare ammunition uh, for only the, o the only war, the Pacific War, uh, I think is uh, sending wake up calls to the ruling party uh, in Warsaw. And uh, I'm happy that they are receiving those signals not to completely, uh, you know, break the bond with the United States, but to become more realistic. And on the other hand, on the flip side, the Continental Party, I think, believes too much that there would ever be a, an ever-closing union and a consolidated state that would handle our security issues. I think it will not, and it will not be Poland's fault. And that, Valina, brings us to the very clear observation 
that Poland needs to get ready for what is coming. And what is coming is already palpable and felt all across our eastern border, most, uh, most importantly, Belarusian border. Mm -hmm. And we will, of course, unpack these uh, latest uh, developments. Uh, but before doing so, there is one major concept I would like you to discuss uh, and, well, actually present shortly and uh, discuss, and that is uh, your uh, concept on a new Polish army model, um, which essentially is uh, being considered as an instrument to save uh, the peace because, uh, uh, as it was uh, outlined, weakness is the greatest temptation for all adversaries and rivals to increase pressure on Poland. Specifically, you named them uh, along the Eastern uh, European uh, borders of not just Poland, but also uh, European Union, uh, in order specifically to force solutions uh, unfavorable to Polish national interests. So what is this uh, um, army uh, model concept, uh, what exactly is the idea behind it? Could you actually present also some of the main features to the uh, audience uh, that does not understand or speak Polish and in a sense um, hears for the very first time about it? Yeah, before I, of course, venture into, you know, our idea of new model force, I, uh, let me let me draw a, a sort of broader lines of the horizon for the audience that don't speak Polish, because uh, I think it might be very interesting from the geostrategy point of view. Mm -hmm. Poland is having a reckoning time. Uh, if, you, if you live in Poland these days and wa watch Polish news and listen to the politicians and see what's going on with our military redeployment to the East these days as we speak, uh, that is a sort of a reckoning time. The words that our politicians are using it's all about gearing up and preparing for the showdown that might be upon us soon, as it has been in the past so many times of the history of both Poland and the Commonwealth, the old land empire of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and so on. So all, all, you know, all lessons of the geostrategic of the last five or 600 years are being right now undusted and uh, the books are being taken from shelves of our old ancestors to read what it is all about and stuff. It's, I think it's a very vibrant time intellectually in Poland. I think it started like six months ago for good. Uh, and in, that, in, in, in wake of that, two weeks ago, the, the, the main political figure, uh, Jarosław Kaczyński, who is running the country basically, uh, announced a major program of the not only modernization, but a major expansion of the Polish military. Actually, to become the second largest, uh, according to his, uh, the second largest army in Europe after Russia. Uh, and that Poland has enough money for that, so manpower, and, you know, the, the, was the detailed program, how to deal with that. So, um, as you see, there is a political stomach, an appetite to feel the force that would be a deterrent force in the East. So Poland apparently wants to play the game and not wait for the you know, ultimatum of the stronger. Uh, and we want to really take it, uh, take this challenge. Uh, and, and now comes a new model force that we posted, that we propose that strategy in the future, because we of course think that this is coming. We of course think that Poland should have the, the, the capabilities uh, that are good enough to counter, but we need to go into details. And our proposition is more or less as follows, you know, to, in a, you know, a simplified form. Poland should feel a standing force, full combat readiness within the current organizational structure of around 100,000 plus territorial troops, but full equipped, fully in full combat readiness and very modern. We need to transform into the revolution military efforts uh, BTGs, uh, drone warfare, uh, you know, complete uh, our own anti access denial capabilities, uh, more combat uh, footprint, and we need to be forward-looking. We need to create our own C2, C5, um, modern reconnaissance battle, modern scouting battle in the east, up to the Daguva Dnieper rivers. We need to create our own umbrella of uh, action, and that's, that's most important. 
because we think that the, the Russian grand strategy of becoming a re responsible stakeholder in European affairs, because this is the utmost, the ultimate objective of the Russian grand strategy, we need to annihilate this objective. And because they, they ex execute this uh, strategy in all dimensions, in all domains, in all actions, under the trigger of Article 5 NATO, NATO uh, uh, treaty, they will stop one millimeter shy from triggering it, wherever this will be. And of course, well, nobody knows where this will be, given the political cohesion of the Western allies, you know, cap military capabilities. So the Russians are beautifully employing all kinds of coercion under the umbrella of perceived escalation dominance to, you know, benefit from the, you know, actually to impose on others. And we simply want to feel the force that will annihilate the strategy that they will never face the escalation, that they will never enjoy the escalation dominance confidence. As simple as it gets. And you don't need to have a big force to know it. You simply need to be more confident, you become more competent in all the loop, in the modern battlefield, in the new revolution, military affairs, in the precision, uh, precision, uh, precision munition regime. When you, you need to simply be more competent in that on the Western main operation. Uh, so, plus, you have Ukraine, you have other allies in Romania. It's doable. Russia is Turkey. not 10 feet tall. Turkey, baby. Even. Russia is not 10 feet tall. And under, and you need to employ uh, operational pl uh, planning under the trigger of kinetic, so a lot of non-kinetic confrontations, and a lot of kinetic, but on the low ranks of the escalation ladder. And Poland can easily afford it, morally, mentally, uh, in terms of manpower, capabilities, spirit, and financial resources. Uh, and that's, the, that's basically the gist of the new model force that we want to field. I think that this force also will be more interoperable in the new look of the American forces, because they're also transforming to be more agile and lean all along the, uh, the defense pyramid in Eurasia, this way or another. So at, the, at one hand, we need to be more independent to create, to you know, establish our own C2 and you know, the modern scouting battle, because it's all about modern scouting battle these days, who, who enjoys uh, information dominance on the battlefield in terms of sensors and effectors in and the system that uh, connects all those wins. And at the same time, we can help Amer Americans balance the system in a way if we are competent enough in that. No, not if we buy enough stuff from Americans, but if we are competent in that. I think the Americans also transition be behind this point of just, you know, just kicking the, the can down the road as all, the, all their allies used to, but they will be picking, the, you know, the, the allies that, are, have transformed into more competent force. And that's what we want to force. We want to face this 21st century. And because the revolution military affairs is relatively in net assessment, favoring the middle powers that are well organized, technologically uh, competent, compared to the great powers with the demography, by the way, Russians have problems with manning the, the troops. So it's, it's, it's not a demographic giant anymore. So this is the advantage we want to, exploit the dynamic asymmetries on the battlefield in non-kinetic and kinetic engagements to secure the win. And we think that the, the, what we call this is active deterrence and it's good enough to save peace in Europe. Okay, we don't want to have situations where Angela Merkel is calling Putin and is, she's discussing the border, the Eastern border, you know, of Pol Poland. Without state. Poland. Without Poland, it's, it's yeah. not going to happen. I mean, that's uh, the things have changed in, uh, in Warsaw. That would be my, of course, uh, next question. Uh, how does Poland fit into the current uh, context of European, European security and defense policy, given that Germany and France will be further pursuing a rapprochement with uh, Russia? Uh, we I think can agree on that trend uh, that it's not going to change with uh, a new German government uh, co that that consists of social democrats, uh, liberals, and the Greens, and also given that uh, there is an anticipation already that Macron 
likely uh, will likely win the presidential election in April next year. So in a sense, this kind of rapprochement that we have been observing already uh, between uh, the French, German engine of the European integration and Russia is going to continue. And you also outlined that uh, United States have been uh, trying that we, we saw it clearly with uh, Trump, but now even Biden has shown certain signals uh, towards Russia with the uh, lifting of the sanctions uh, against Nord Stream 2, but also with the expectations that Russia might bring China to the table uh, when it comes to the future of uh, the arms control uh, as well as uh, the nuclear weapons. And China is not uh, party of these uh, negotiations yet, but probably United St uh, States are looking for an option where they can give a role to the Russians so that they bring the Chinese to the table. So in a sense, given this geopolitical context, how do you see that Poland would fit into this, uh, into this uh, main... Uh, into this main uh, geopolitical context, uh, and specifically uh, when it comes to the ongoing European security and defense debates. We are having now a debate on strategic compass. What is uh, Poland's role? And what is the political backup of this, of yeah. this uh, model at home? Yeah, so that's, the, um, that's um, the, 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 you know, the most important question that you have just asked. And of course, Poland's uh, geopolitical situation is uh, is getting worse. That's exactly for the reasons that you have described. So you know, so uh, elegantly uh, trying to save me from you know feeling because that's that's exactly the the pressure we are feeling, and we're trying to find a way out of it. Uh, and new model force is one of the one of the tools. Uh, b before I offer that, because I want to venture in detail in trying to address all the you know challenges that you have uh, outlined. But before I do that, I, I want to say that we are at the, the, the debate now whether we want a big army and our new model force strategy and future is at the my strategy and future is at the forefront of this debate in Poland. And of course, I would do a lot to make my plan happen because we think this is the future for the country and that gives us the leverage and the foreign policy tool as well in this new turbulent times that are upon us and it will be like a win more of a winning chance machine than the um, you know, the legacy force uh, uh, that uh, the government is trying to propose uh, but uh, you know and there are of course a lot of circles in the military you know as always that want to, to have a modern a change a major because that that goes for that that, that calls for the uh, philosophical change of the of the force and so on so i am optimist so i think that we we will prevail in this debate honestly speaking sooner or later in poland uh, and for sure i will write a book about it about the sort of uh, what was in the background you know it's a fascinating story by the way let me not uh, dwell upon it uh, too much to, in our conversation, but this is history in the making. But, you know. uh, but coming back to that, that's exactly the other thing. You know? That's why Poland's geopolitical uh, location is so dire. And also that's why Poland was such a you know, pain in, you know, in the rear part of everybody's body, because uh, there is one Valina, fundamental, vital interest in our geostrategy of the last 650 years of Poland and the old Commonwealth. Russia is out of the European system of balancing. And for the last 600 years, all, for most of this part, we have succeeded. As is it, as, as you know, and this is shocking for the Western countries of, on the continent because they, they, they learned the, uh, you know, the Russians became the stakeholder in the European affairs with the Northern War in the 18th century. And then they remained until the collapse in the First World War. Uh, they collapsed in the First World War to Germans, then they had the revolution, then they lost to the Polish army in, 2000, in 1920. And they, for the next 20 years, they were out of the game and we had independence. They came back to the game in, in August, 1939, and they be signing the Continental Pact with Germany. 
And because they were so important also for the Anglo-Saxon world powers of the world ocean, they won the war and they stayed there until what? The collapse of the Soviet Union. And then they were out of the game again. For We thought it was for good. And they were out of the game. That's why European Union expanded. And that's why NATO expanded. They were out of the game. NATO was set up in the first place to keep Russians out of the balancing system. So when it expanded, we thought that it was supposed to anchor this final resolution of the Russian affairs in the world affairs. And that's why Poland, without any doubt, supported all expansion of the European Union and NATO. And that's why we exercised what we call today the strategic restraint in the East. Because we didn't, over the last 30 years, and it is changing now, we didn't feel the force that could project power into the East. We didn't create the proper influence in the, in the East. And that was the, uh, our natural uh, zone of interest. Because we thought that the Western values, the Western powers, the Western world, liberal world would prevail in an automated mode. And now we think it's not going to happen. And now we're going to take the, the things into our own hands. And the, the problem is that who the Ru Russia is for the European powers. And whether it's a stakeholder in European affairs for Germany. Because it's not for Ukraine. It's, it, it's not for Lithuania. Preferably, it's, it shouldn't be for Romania. That's, that's a different divergence of interest between the Central and East European countries and the Western European countries of fundamental proportions. Because right now, it turns out that despite being at NATO and within one single EU, Germany needs Russia for, for this, for that. France needs Russia for you know, dealing with Turkey and this and that. And because Russia is a poor country and all it has is energy, so we need, you know, Europe needs it for energy and for the competence in the new generation warfare, you know, mechanism, whether they stabilize or destabilize. So suddenly they are a partner to our Western allies. This is the most fundamental different difference of interest between Poland and the Western, Western Europeans. Uh, and, uh, for example, I wonder what's going to be inside the, the NATO strategic um, concept uh, 2030, because I think the test for Poland will be easy. Whether NATO will accept that all actions under Article 5 are also within authority of NATO, and NATO has to react somehow to, to sort of deter Russia from achieving the objective of becoming a stakeholder that Merkel needs to call to discuss the border, then I think, you know, we will be in a completely new paradigm, in a completely new world. I think that there will be a, a new, uh, you know, well, there will be old clothes, but there will be a new world. And that's, that's, uh, one, that's, that's one thing that the Western European powers need to understand if they want to have this, the European Union functioning properly and NATO really performing still. Uh, that's, that's number one. The second thing is that... Uh, the, the, you know, also there is a problem with the United States, uh, as Colby, whom I mentioned already once, uh, said that uh, sometimes it takes everything to defeat China. And, you know, there is a suspicion in Poland that, uh, you know, when sea power takes on the continental power, you need to create the anti-hegemonic alliance and Russia is a pivotal state in that, in that system. And uh, we also, it's my personal opinion that uh, the Russians are thinking that the United States is losing. And that's the only reason why there is no deal yet. Uh, that's a, because the Americans are thinking that they are on the, from the position of strength. That's why they control the situation with the Russians. I think that the Russians simply think that the Americans are losing. And that's why they don't want to how do we call it? We don't, they don't want to enter the deal today. They want to see who is winning. Because if China wins for good, they are in a very vulnerable position. But if the United States, States wins, they are in the same position as they were in the 90s of the 20th century, from which they are trying to escape. 
So Russia is becoming a pivotal state in this game, and we see it more. So we are not blinded by, you know, by, uh, by, you know. And of course, we understand that we are weaker than all those parties that I have mentioned in the last five minutes. And still, we need to navigate somehow, you know, to address our national goals. And, uh, you know, uh, adding to what I said uh, about the, the, you know, this continental party and the neo Atlantic party, that's why they are, they both err in some, to some extent. I think it will be much more sophisticated and much more flexible in order to navigate properly uh, through those uh, uncharted waters and very turbulent waters of the, of the coming future. Mm-hmm. And let alone, we need a new model force to, to help us, yeah? to help us control the escalation ladder, to control the strategic flows that might destabilize or strengthen Poland. And you know, in both scenarios, we need it, Belina, because if there is, of course, if we are imposed and we have the, uh, the continental Europe, united, then it will also have to feel the force to negotiate with Russians the sort of uh, security issues this way or another. And if the United States prevails and it is back stronger in Europe and in Europe does not become a you know, separate pole of power, so we need to have this force all along. And if both those scenarios don't work, <laughs> we need it even more. So basically, that's the uh, that's uh, that's the thing. I made it in a very simplistic way because I understand that I cannot consume of your of your of your time, Valina. But I could talk for like long hours. Uh, last time I talked, imagine for twelve hours about the new model force without break, only coffee while talking. I'm a, I talk too much sometimes, <laughs> but it was with slides, so that was you know I, I that was not that boring. Well, I promise you that I will spare you the 12 hours, but um, you perfectly managed to uh, actually communicate uh, some of the main messages uh, from this concept. But uh, for our audience, uh, as an additional information, there are several books published already by uh, Dr. Batusiak on uh, topics that he just uh, scratched upon. Uh, as the one on war and peace from 2018, on the geostrategic uh, situation of Poland in Europe, in an era of uh, growing rivalry between um, uh, powers in Eurasia, or the Pacific and Eurasia about the war from 2016. So feel free to actually uh, buy these books and uh, learn more about this um, uh strategic thinking behind it. We certainly cannot address all of the issues uh, just in 60 minutes. But uh, speaking of strategic flows um, and the way how actually Poland in coordination with other European powers might uh, address some of these issues is, uh, for instance, uh, the newly launched uh, Three Cs initiative, um, which um, uh, Poland has been a great proponent of. Um, Do you see this um, uh, initiative that might also, if uh, successfully implemented, create uh, new connectivity for strategic flows from the north of Europe, um, starting with the Baltics uh, via the connection between the three seas uh, in the north, Um, then, of course, uh, the Black Sea uh, area with the Black Sea and, of course, then the Adriatic Sea. Uh, Do you see this uh, uh, as a kind of a new um, uh, geo-strategic approach? Uh, Or is it just a prolongation of the old uh, thinking of the Intermarium launched by Piłsudski? What is your personal view on that? can such ambitious geopolitical and geoeconomic projects succeed uh, in this decade? Uh, I personally see this as the probably most ambitious uh, European way of uh, actually creating a new connectivity for strategic flows from the north to the south and then connecting it to the um, increasingly vibrant North African and Eastern um, littorals of uh, Africa so that actually our main line of trade flows uh, via the 
uh, Indo-Pacific is guaranteed. That means also in the future, uh, creating a direct line between uh, future strategic partner India and uh, the uh, European continent through the Three Seas Initiative. But I would be, of course, curious to hear your personal view on that. Okay, this is again a giant, uh, or using the Trump's term, huge uh, uh, subject. You know, let me start by uh, you know laying out the, 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 the certain Polish geostrategic objectives. Simply, the the old Commonwealth, the old land empire, as we say in Poland, uh, often you know, talking the family on Independence Day or reading up Polish literature. That's what we say. Uh, you know was operating strategic flows of those times, uh, not in, you know, on the, uh, this uh, west-east axis as it, is, as it does now. Our old country operated on the north, south, and uh, slightly, you know, northeast, south, southwest, uh, and southeast and northwest axis of trade and military power projection and so on. That gave, that in the long run, gave the connectivity all across the region up to the Black Sea and the Dnieper River and beyond, and the Dagova River and Livonia and Estonia and also to Romania, all along east of Carpathians and so on. And also to Hungary, uh, to the, you know, to the uh, Danube River system of interconnectivity. That persisted. Yeah? It was annihilated during the partition period by the Russians and Germans and, and Habsburg Empire, because they create in the, the modern era they created the system of connectivity towards Vienna, Berlin, St. Petersburg, and Moscow. To the major devastation of the really hubs of connectivity of the old of, of the old country, and uh, everything that follows from that, yeah. And it was always always a dream of Poles when we resurrected after the First World War to build the North-South connectivity to become independent from Germany and Russia. And that's why we built the port of Dania, we built Silesia, that's why we built, you know, the, uh, we had part of Silesia. That's why we built industrial complex in the South and connected it by railway and the world ocean via Gdynia port near Danzig and so on, right? And that was always like that. Eugenius Romer was writing extensively about it, and Intermarium was always in the Polish Jewish We won the war against the Soviets in 1920, but because we faltered and we didn't move east beyond the Dnieper River, because we were too tired, maybe. Piłsudski was writing that he felt that soldiers were too tired. Society, the political system was too tired of four five. Four years of world war and then the three, two years of war of major, major war with, with Soviets. Uh, so he didn't have enough resources to finish them off and create an intermarium with Ukraine and Belarus, quasi independent, to become within the Federation. That has always been a plan. That's always been a plan. And Piłsudski from that day, although he secured a major victory, he knew that he lost the peace and it was only an interval, a break in the independence. And he was right. He became a very pessimistic person after that, after the Treaty of Riga. But coming back, you know, uh, returning to the current situation, the future. Once the inter we have- Mario. The inter Mario. Mario. No. Remember one <laughs> the thing- The Trimarium. Right? Now for, it's called for, the Trimarium, right? Yes, for Poland, Intermarium, it's all about Ukraine because, you know, it's all about Poland and Ukraine and maybe Romania. That's, that's, a, that's the primary thing. And uh, the reason why uh, we advocated for the three C's was to create a belt of countries that will be connected north and south and will, will build their own connectivity system and hoping that it would engulf Ukraine sooner or later despite the will of great China, of course, proposed its own 16 plus one. Russia was vehemently opponent, 
opposing it. It's a very long story. Three C's, I, I, I was reading three C's and I per actively participated in thinking about it and also was uh, was running the, the major infrastructure, the, the largest infrastructure project in the history of, of this of this region, so Central uh, Solidarity Transport Hub. That was a, you know, a, an effectively a, a dream of Polish geopolitics, so to speak, of creating connectivity, proper connectivity. We wanted to, to, to connect all those countries that were orphans of the great world ocean discovery of the 16th century, that were out of the Atlantic game and wanted to create a new infrastructure to, to, to sort of you know, create a pole yeah, of trade and connectivity. The problem is, and has been, that it is between the great powers that are not interested too much in it. So we uh, anchored this concept on US. Uh, building a lot from old Mackinder's concept, right? Of um, uh, basically, it's all about always sea powers concept of driving a wedge between the continental powers and creating the connectivity. So we borrowed extensively from Mackinder's concept, and Americans supported it exactly for that reason. The problem is that the Americans failed to provide financial uh, support for that, uh, to you know, in, in sufficient amounts to make it happen. To make it happen, and you know, in, in times where there was not yet the great power competition in Eurasia, that was the moment to flow in the money that the Americans were printing anyway, <laughs> extensively as they do now, and they didn't, and they didn't. Uh, you know, just maybe it might be interesting for your listeners that uh, exactly at the same time the Chinese came to us proposing the 16 plus one with the poles of the anchor because we are in the entering zone into Europe. You need to control Poland and Romania if you want to send goods from Eurasia, either through the you know, broad Baltic Sea region, the Danube River system, or the Northern European plain. You need both those two players. The problem was that Germany didn't like this idea, both in terms of three seas or some Chinese concept. So they wanted to take over and watch out, and they did. To cut a long story short, they did, mostly because Poland, because the, the United States didn't provide sufficient money. I think there will be books about it uh, some, somewhere in the future, why the Americans didn't provide sufficient funding for that to make it happen. It's in, of, of course, it's still in the making, but I think that the, 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 the window of opportunity at least the, the opening window of opportunity was missed, exactly because there was no great power competition yet at that time, and now there is. So Germany is watching the supply chains. The COVID, you know, also stresses it even more. So Germans didn't like the idea that the economies of the region would not be connected directly in the hub and spoke system to the German economy, creating proper uh, structure of strategic flows operating to the benefit of the German economy as a heart of the European economy. Because, uh, you know, that might be detrimental to the German interest. So they sort of took over. The, and also, as I said about Nord Stream, I think they also convinced Biden administration uh, to give the guardianship of the project to the Germans, just like else, like with the energy to Ukraine's, uh, Ukrainians and so on. You know what I mean, right? Of course, which is probably one of the reasons why nothing has happened since then. Yeah, exactly. And why we are, you know, we have been on the idle gear all along that way. And the Chinese, I was there when the Chinese probed us, and Chinese understood all this very well. They are very cunning people, and you know, you don't need to explain the Chinese post concept of strategic flows. They 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 are born with it. Okay, so uh, the uh, they came, they saw the map, and they understood. Uh, you know, I didn't need to explain to the Chinese, even the Polish North, North, North South Romers concept. They, they knew it sort of, you know, they, they, as if eating, you know, food. So they just, they, they, they understand that immediately. And the problem was that the, uh, the, the, the Chinese didn't see the decision-making process in Poland and elsewhere in the region. So they went directly to Germans and also Germans sort of took over the agenda and uh, now it's germany and france that is running that are running the agenda of relationship with china for good and for worse 
whatever the, it entails, yeah, for the future of Europe and the transatlantic relationship and this crash zone of Poland, Romania, and other countries of the region. So ba- basically, that's a glimpse of the situation as a superstructure, I believe. Well, I argue personally that uh, this kind of German-French approach um, or continental European approach uh, towards uh, China, but also increasingly towards Russia, will end up in a situation where we on the continental Europe will be facing actually more assertive China, more assertive Russia, whereas our allies and partners from the Rimland, uh, basically led by the United States, and we witnessed this with uh, with the AUKUS, so basically the Anglo-Saxon approach uh, to both actors will increasingly divert, and in a sense there will be a huge dividing line within the West where there will yes. be two simultaneously developing approaches to yes. the future systemic yes. rivalry with China, but also to the positioning of middle-sized powers. And yes. I don't think that we uh, on a continental Europe within the European Union are really well served in terms of national interests, in terms of future European interests, if we are to actually divert from the Anglo-Saxon countries. And the AUKUS is just a symptom of something much bigger than actually the outcome of it. Yeah, the Americans are tired of of explaining that to the continental Europeans. And the question is, I mean, maybe I will ask the question to you. Uh, Why are they behaving like that on the continent? Is it because like French, apparently seem to believe that the American is already in decline and the you know and is behind the point of no return. So they need to adjust to the new Eurasia with the Chinese presence and Russia being a stakeholder and they need to sort of reshape the European continent in terms of you know and they simply need to adjust this way or another. Or like it seems uh, in case of Germans that they like sitting on the fence because they make money, a lot of money on that. And they think that they have don't need to choose yet, and that may end up uh, in the completely turbulent times of completely disorganized system, where the Chinese and the Americans will be, you know, quarreling above our heads and making the, 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 the taking the calls. I mean, the taking the shots, and sort of imposing on us new technology, military, and stuff. So, what is your take on that? Why are they behaving like that? What is their point of what is their diagnosis? What is their point of reference? And what do you think about it? I think it starts with the false diagnostics in first place. And when you have the false diagnostics, you're also treating the um, symptoms uh, with the wrong uh, medicine. Uh, The false diagnostics uh, is derived from the fact that the expectation is that we are going to uh, act as what we call here in Austria, um, an island of the blast. So we call ourselves the island of the blast. I think that the European continent um, now increasingly following Brexit is moving towards this idea of becoming a neutral giant island of the blast where nobody is actually having any bad intentions towards us. We are going to be respected. We are going to be treated uh, accordingly, mm-hmm. uh, everyone is coming <laughs> to Europe for business or tourism, and nobody is having bad intentions. And this is a false diagnostics in first place. So, oscillating, as you pointed out, is definitely the now the main strategy of the European Union and uh, the French-German axis: oscillating, not taking sides uh, in the systemic rivalry between the United States and China, which is actually on the tactical level. Uh, not really a bad idea, but uh, in the long run, it would, uh, we, as we know, uh, mean also <laughs> while sitting between two chairs, being displaced or squeezed by both powers. And this is what I foresee for the long run. So imagine how I feel in Poland, where we are even further from this uh, crazy Atl- Atlantic Ocean that you know was driver of prosperity for the last 500 years. And we are even more squeezed by this oscillation policy of the West, France, and Germany. Russia resurrecting and pressuring us on the borders and the military, you know, muscle, um, you know, and exercising the capabilities. China approaching EU regulations, no clear vision where it heads for. And the 
United States reshuffling, readjusting, taking a good look, whether it wants to fall back towards the world ocean and become the offshore balancer here and there, and that would detach us from the US, the air base. Mm. The, 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 the environment that Poland is entering is deteriorating very quickly. And we haven't prepared ourselves for the last 30 years because we believed in the end of history and that the West would prevail because the values, the liberal values were so prevalent. We are, as I told you half an hour ago, we are reckoning to the new reality and undusting our own books on geostrategy and you know our approaches to the capital. If you see the Polish troops redeploying, you see on the streets of Warsaw now and you know elsewhere, and we had Independence Day yesterday and then 11th of November and the streets. Uh, that's really, that you know, gives you a sense of history happening. Yeah? Uh, we will see how it, uh, you know, how it develops. Well, we indeed did not witness the end of history as it was predicted 30 years ago. However, we might witness the end of the European history as we've known, in, known it from the last many centuries. And one way I really fear this might end up is that Europe becomes a geopolitical backyard of the global affairs. And one symptom of that is if we look at what is going on right now in the Eastern European terrain, where Russia has been orchestrating and Belarus has been implementing this kind of uh, instrumentalization of uh, migration flows, and this would be my next question uh, for you, uh, specifically the hybrid uh, warfare that is, has been conducted uh, against Poland, Lithuania, specifically, of course, against the Eastern um, European border of the European Union. How do you um, analyze and assess this border escalation between Poland and uh, Belarus. What is your uh, analysis also on the way how now a new kind of pressure is being exerted on Poland and this kind of blackmail policy uh, against the European Union as we've witnessed it already once uh, in the uh, past with uh, the migration flows uh, in 2015 and uh, what, what followed actually as a deal between the European Union and Turkey. Um, do you think that Russia learned a lesson and now is trying to uh, actually apply a similar approach to Poland, knowing that this will destabilize the country? Uh, the country has been already having issues with the European Union and also expecting that the European Union will do nothing more than probably some sanctions and some uh, diplomatic and uh, verbal, um, uh, well, um, messages. Uh, beyond that, no, nothing in terms of hard power exercise will happen um, in that uh, context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a very, what we face at the border is a very dangerous situation that might quickly escalate. Uh, the Russians and their Belarusian proxies are acting within this escalation dominance, uh, you know, confidence that they enjoy it and that they choose the place of attack and choose of the pressure and the place and moment and convenience of the, of the pressure employed against Poland. Uh, so far, we're doing fine in terms of the uh, sort of uh, taking on it. Uh, and also, increasingly, I think there is a more, more and more unified stance in the political elites of both, you know, sides of the aisle, you know, how to respond to it. Uh, uh, we, what I would propose to the Polish government uh, and, you know, to, for us is simply to understand that the West will not deal with, with, I mean, they will not address it. We need to address it. First of all, uh, the second is that we need to quickly calm the situation down on the border because we haven't been prepared in terms of the information warfare, non-kinetic engagements, proactive stance and other you know, horizontal escalations because this is actually the, uh, the confrontation, okay? And we, because we are such a nice boy and we live within the democratic, you know, European Union and stuff, we only react proportionally, just, you know, they're trying to, to, to do something. 
they you know they shoot in the air you know because there are incidents already right so what we should do is to to calm down the situation so that the russians because we haven't been prepared when we were entering the situation to so we need, we should to calm down make it go away somehow by act, acting re reactively but at nights we should get ready for the new phase and then we shouldn't you know we shouldn't just be reactive Evelina. Uh, what I called in the non kinetic scenario, proactive stance, horizontal escalations, you know, they need to pay the price for that. And uh, basically that's what I would expect from the, from the Western allies as well, because otherwise it's always gonna be Putin who will be orchestrating the solution, political solution to this thing. Uh, that's the nature of war, especially in the non kinetic phase of it, information warfare. There are many domains that you can inflict pain on somebody. And I think that Poland should, like a boxer, we should hold on in this sort of confrontation, only in the reactive stance, in the defensive mode. But once the stormy waters, like hopefully in 10 days or 25 days, I'm not sure it will happen, probably not. We should regroup and then without hesitation, also we should initiate different things that would make them pay the price. That's uh, that's the nature of this confrontation. However uh, weird it sounds, uh, Verina, but that's uh, that's how you need to act in this uh, environment because otherwise you are always losing sight, and especially in the information domain, we should get ready for that. Yeah, uh, and the, the the what I call the whole um, resistance systems of the Polish state should get uh, geared up for that. You know, non-kinetic engagements, non-kinetic multi-domain, cross-domain competition, under Article 5, triggering, you know, information and so on. Yes, and um, maybe just a um, very short additional question. Uh, as we know that the European Border and Coast Guard Agency, the, which is known as Frontex, is in fact uh, based in Warsaw. The headquarter is um, in Warsaw, Poland. Uh, were there any uh, actually talks already between the Polish government and the Frontex or any official statements by Frontex uh, in uh, terms of uh, potential uh, measures or actual measures that Frontex yeah. seeks to imply? Uh, and also, do, did you receive already um, beyond the diplomatic uh, messages uh, coming from all European capitals and the uh, European Union institutions, any relevant uh, help, uh, real help from any European Union member state? Of course, regarding... I, may not, I, I may not know about everything, you know, that is, for example, you know, secret or... Uh, sort of, of course, I mean, I mean has, has been any, any, any discussion yeah. whatsoever in the public, uh, of course. But, but, you know, Verena, you need to realize, you know, the listeners need to realize that Frontex basically don't have personnel. The personnel comes from the countries so exactly th yes those guys this... those guys don't have capabilities to really help that's you know that's a reality on the ground okay and any yeah. help coming from i hope any, for I, instance, I hope it's not direct... i hope it's a it's not a power price mm -hmm. for the european union as a whole you know it's uh it's a polish military the board guards the uh, the police, the territorial defense, that is holding the the border. That's 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 reality. Okay. Well, that's common European Union border. We have to stress that once again because uh, I think it's also important that. Uh, um, this kind of border crisis uh, are tend to uh, become a national problem for the country facing them. But in reality, the repercussions are not only for the individual member states, the repercussions are actually long term for the whole. That means for the whole European Union. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if the European Union really were to become a superpower, a great unified state, it would have like a thousand methods and leverages to really unwind the situation and coerce both Lukashenko and Putin to, to behave properly, you know, but the problem is that 
apparently there is no unified state. And there is, uh, you know, Frontex is, uh, is having some personnel, but it's, you know, you can't, it can't compare numbers to anything that Poland feels okay, and can feel. Uh, so the politicians yesterday were asked about this in Poland and they, they said exactly what I said, you know, but the guys don't have personnel. So what the, what the heck? I mean, what for? So, uh, so ba basically, that's that's uh, that's uh, that's the thing. We will see how the pressure, because the border is long, uh, the the river flows uh, only through part of it, and it's not it's not a big river. It's not the Dnieper River. It's a Bug River, which is it's winter time, swampy. It's not easy to cross, but it's not it's not the Mississippi River. If, if you know English speakers, know what I mean. It's uh, you know. Um, uh, so we will see how it develops and the winter is coming. We are on the Northern European plain and there is already freezing temperature in at night. So, uh, and our troops are in the field also. So we will see uh, how it all develops. Yeah. So uh, it's a very escalatory, potential escalatory situation. You know, according to some reports, Lukashenko yesterday uh, on the eve of... Uh, uh, at night, uh, at night, I uh, asked the, the Russians to provide troops to protect the border because uh, the, the, the Polish troops are, you know, getting ready for something. So as you see, Marina, there is a potential for escalation. Yeah, and uh, if Russians are thinking that they enjoy the escalation dominance control in full spectrum, they can easily choose the moment when they want to escalate. We need to simply deprive them of this feeling. And I think that the political solution is not going to work because you need to have capabilities to make the Russians feel that they may be easily deprived of the escalation dominance and that would annihilate their grand strategy objective to show themselves as the uh, stakeholder in European affairs. So, you know, in, it's all about capabilities. As in line with your podcast, uh, you know, philosophy, it's all about realist approach to the issue and the question is whether european countries can really provide capabilities that will make russians and they whether they have the political cohesion the political will to provide capabilities to deprive russians of the escalation dominance okay that's basically uh, because the russians want to sit at the table now and discuss the status of the polish eastern border maybe or maybe some other things you know today this tomorrow that now. It starts by small steps and suddenly yes, you have yeah, it's, a it's, it's completely different uh, situation. Well, one probably breakthrough was uh, the promise by Turkey to actually uh, make the Turkish airlines uh, deny uh, travel uh, or you know, stop facilitating travel for asylum seekers um, who are coming, for instance, from Syria. And we know that in Syria, even though that they are not avert, uh, there is no avert proof for, um, for a Russia, for, 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 for the direct role of Russia in this whole crisis. Um, very often, um, the lack of uh, evidence is not evidence of absence, right? So in a sense, we know that uh, Russia is operating on the Syrian ground. For instance, if we take this in, uh, as an example, there is certainly a kind of a facilitation, um, orchestrating uh, role um, by Russia in this whole um, in this whole uh, instrumentalization of the migration flow. So maybe this is also one way how to uh, how to navigate uh, the crisis by, for instance, uh, increasing the Turkish role as, for instance, we know that Turkey is always uh, also trying to protect and pursue its own national interests and a strong Russian role is detrimental to uh, the Turkish national interests, specifically in, uh, in, in Europe. So in a sense, maybe this is one way how to also um, navigate it uh, in the short term in order to actually prevent further escalation. Yeah, but in the longer scale and the longer you know, perspective, you, we need to think to accustom the situation of the Bismarckian negotiate and fight, bargain and fight at the same time the Turks have been doing it. I think this new uh, new world of Eurasia consolidation with this world power ebbing away a bit 
uh, it's going to be more like that. Tomorrow you're my friend and the next day you might be my foe because we have conflict interest in that, you know, and so on. And this is, Russians are very good at it, you know. But and we, look- we sort of became, belie- uh, we, 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 came, we came to believe that this is, you know, well, like a single uh, 10 commandments of behavior how, where you can operate uh, while the history of the humanity proved otherwise. And uh, I'm really, I'm really concerned that we're moving back to the old traditional uh, positioning, polit- political positioning across Eurasia if we do not uh, step up our efforts and consolidate, you know. Uh, and then countries like Poland, you know, Ukrainians already know that, already know. They, you know, they, they were taught a lesson, right? That's why they talk to Turks, they talk to British, they talk to Chinese, they, they talk to everybody who would help them militarily and in terms of energy, and, right? Absolutely. Although, and do you think that uh, Poland would be ready to deploy hard power in the Eastern European neighborhood at some point? Speaking of, for instance, you know, now it any kind to... of projects about expeditionary forces or battle units in the future, would Poland be ready to deploy uh, I think, I think we Polish are, soldiers? First of all, we have already have, like we sent, for example, the uh, coastal batteries to Estonia, you know, anti-ship missiles already and to Romania uh, in recent uh, times just to show Russians that they cannot freely maneuver from the Gulf of Finland or on approaches to the Danube River estuary. So, uh, you know, without risk. Uh, I think that as Heiko Bocet uh, professionally and stated in his report on the, uh, uh, one of the, the most recent reports on the military transformations and innovation, the, because the, the, the war is all about systems now, you know, networking systems and effectors and all the... You know, I think it might be so that there will be things called war, war as a service. Yeah. So, for example, that you deploy one BTG uh, battalion tactical group, or instead of that, you know, the the UAV drone, the UAV unit, like Turks did, or the radar system with some effectors, or some precision missile artillery unit, just to consolidate your proxies, ally uh, defense, or something. And I see no reason why Poland shouldn't uh, shouldn't be, uh, I mean, implementing this new modern battlefield reality. Okay. Uh, also, you know, Poland has had a, a long history of uh, the great soldiery, uh, mercenaries even uh, called the subjects, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the early modern era, known across Europe. And, uh, you know, uh, there is this gray zone now, you know, below Article 5, small groups of, you know, violence. Uh, you know, we, we need to find response to that. You know what was happening in Donbass, right? What, what, you know, what, how Russians employ completely different tools of coercion. Violence, like guerrilla warfare, you know, some uh, theoretically unorganized groups of uh, violence providers, you know. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. very, very nice. We need to get ready for that. There you are some questions the also from the audience. Would you like to, to, to sure. stay a little bit longer with us? Sure. Because mm-hmm. uh, apparently there are a lot of questions. We cannot, of course, address all of them. Uh, there is a question. Uh, can you make an educated guess when a consequential conflict may develop between Poland and Russia? Do you have a timeline for that? Or in other words, how much time do you, do, does Poland have to modernize? I think that the conflict is already upon us. And, uh, you know, just as it was in the 17th, 16th, 17th, 18th century already, you know, at the beginning of it. Uh, they're trying to destabilize us. This for another, probing us. So, the, you know, I think we, we slept too long, by the way. And we are not ready and we need to get ready as, as soon as possible. That's my most educated answer as it gets. I think we need, to, we, of course, we need time, but we need to very quickly uh, get ready uh, for things, for the contingencies that might uh, emerge. Uh, that's why for the last, you know, 
17 months at Strategy in Future, we have been really working hard, sometimes 16 hours per day, to prepare the new model force concept for the Polish military. That will be state of the art uh, and the, 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 the tool to win, not just to, I don't know, buy time or we have the theory of victory, we have everything, you know, just there, just so that the Russians don't think that they have full escalation dominance. And uh, do you think, uh, or do you have a suggestion how Poland could isolate Russia from resolving the crisis on the yeah. Polish Belarus border? Uh, that's, I saw this question, that's a very tough one. I think at the moment it cannot isolate. <laughs> but, well, you know, imagine, in a world where we would have a completely new military and a new modern force, that we would be capable of inflicting pain on Lukashenko and on the Russians if they really wanted to move up along the escalation ladder. Then we could call Angara Melka and say, you know, stop calling him. We don't need you. It's useless. And then the Russians will not be discussing it or they will be discussing it with us on our terms, maybe, if we are successful in depriving them of feeling of escalation dominance and all across domains of non-kinetic and kinetic engagements. We don't need any, you know, in, in that case, we wouldn't need any phone calls from Germany or France to discuss affairs that are far away from Paris. There are more questions coming, should I? Sure. Uh, ask them it's up to you uh, to to say no i mean if we've been in the session for more than 70 minutes now i don't let's know go. Whether... let's let's move forward let's move forward is there a way to step down from current border crisis without engaging frontex and making big temporary refugee camps uh, on polish border to speed up asylum or deportation procedures uh, this is one question and there is another one to border crisis and uh, then i promise no more questions on the border crisis but this is of course the main question for uh, for the Polish audience, for sure, and uh, certainly for many people in Europe. Is it possible then the whole border crisis is a distraction? Uh, the main goal is to have Russians flanking Ukraine from the north, and they will be then the real victim of, uh, you know, of this escalation. And if so, is NATO really able to stand up, or will they just accept Russian aggression once again, like it was the case in 2014, following the annexation of Crimea and uh, military involvement in Eastern Ukraine? Yeah, thanks for those two questions. Uh... I, I think it's a very good question how to step uh, down and de-escalate the uh, escalation over the border, which would be in Polish in Poland's interest, so to speak. So don't take me as a hawk. I'm not as hawkish as it sounds. I just want to win. But I understand that we need to de-escalate the border thing because we haven't been prepared properly to that. But I don't think uh, that's you know the, the answer to this concrete uh, point in the question. I don't think that setting up big temporary refugee camps in Poland, within Poland, would uh, answer. There is no political, there is no so society doesn't want it. The, the government would collapse, I think, if that were to happen. There is mm -hmm. a strong resolve in the Polish society to, to, to saturate the border and uh, to seal it. And um, that's how I see it. Yeah. Of course, there are all people that are, you know, reasonably concerned about uh, those children and women and, and men and health and freezing temperatures. But I understand very now we're talking about the real geopolitics. It, that, it's not the essence of it. You know, there is, there is always in wars and in peace and economy and in life and death, there is always a humane aspect of it, you know, and that's how the world has been with us since, since its creation or emergence. But at the uh, but that, that's uh, that's the essence okay of control of strategic flows and to to michael uh of uh, that might be so and as you know there are reports from the u.s agencies that the russians are you know, trying that might be contemplating uh doing harm uh, to ukraine and the russians have been very over the last 500 years they were very sophisticated and very wise in creating this maskirovka approach that they, they start up the, you know, flare, they flare up here, 
just really make a decisive move there. And that would be, I think, uh, more reasonable for the Russians to, to do it because they need to swallow Ukraine, to support the Ukraine, I think, before they can move against Poland, honestly speaking. Because if Ukraine were a power projection staging area for the US, Russian forces, Marina, trust me, maybe we wouldn't be talking here because uh, we would be, Poland would be in a very vulnerable position. A vulnerable position. Yeah, that's why Ukraine and its independence is the best ally of Poles. And, you know, Poland has gone to many wars over that issue with Russia. And uh, so we strongly support the Ukraine independence and the Ukraine military mm -hmm. so that they take a fight and so survive. Uh, I think that, you know, that the, there is no containment of Russia without Poland and Ukraine together. Uh, and very enough for the Western audience, Ukraine is a powerful country, but it was completely devastated. It's a huge territory with so many smart people. Do you know that they engineered all those rockets for the Soviets and other things? I know, but many don't. <laughs> I know, of course, do, but do you many know what's don't know that now? The, they the are. Turks, their Turks are hiring engineers right now and, you know, in numbers every day for, to work for the cruise missiles, for the cruise, en for, you know, engines and stuff. Ukraine is such a pool of resources from agriculture to raw materials to human uh, capital. I mean, uh, it has been such a shame on the, you know, West that it, it, it didn't make a move. Uh, at the due time, yeah. And do you and, anticipate a new military escalation now in this winter, uh, given that there has been a recent deployment by Russian troops once again? Not the first uh, time, not the last time, but do you anticipate now? I need to ask this question because you are currently talking about Ukraine and there have been some analysis as to whether Russia will make a move once again in the winter. I, I honestly, I don't know. I don't know. The, the Russians, as you know, under Serdyukov and Shoigu, uh, reform that uh, has transitioned Russia from this Milutinist reform of the 19th century of the great territorial army that mobilized and slowly takes up ammunition and, um, and equipment and moves to the field. It became a full combat, I mean, partly full combat readiness that can to ex stop exercise and can deploy and redeploy and move along this continental vastness of the Russian empire uh, in small numbers, but big enough to, to impose on the neighbors. So the Russians can really quickly make an action. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a major change that the West don't understand and the NATO doesn't understand properly, I think, because the, the, the force posture is not res uh, sufficiently responding to this reality that the Russians Although they don't have a big army, they don't force big Soviet-style army anymore. They are lean and agile and good enough in this part of the world to impose on the neighborhood. And that's what I, that's what I fear. And the, Ukrainians, and the Ukrainians cannot deliver the proper statehood. <laughs> Just, I'm, so, I'm very blunt here. Uh, for, for, for most of all, out, you know, out, external factors that are kind of destabilizing them all the time uh, that's a very sad story by the way and we would we watch it with uh, growing uh, we have been watching it a long, you know, long time and long. as i said ukraine is uh, the future of poland might depend on, on the future of ukraine so to speak and trust me if something happens in ukraine and the russians move in and uh, ukraine becomes a power projection uh, platform for Ukraine for Pol uh, against Poland everything will change uh, I, I, everything is changing that right now but I wanted to, to the our Western mm. speaking, speaking audience I wanted to emphasize the fact that Ukraine is not a far away country of poverty and thing it's a geopolitical pivot of Europe as uh, as for example Zbigniew Brzezinski used to used to, used to claim in his, in his multiple books uh, Russia is not a European power without subordinating Ukraine. Well, 
I certainly have many, many more questions, as you might imagine, but I really don't want to push push the border too long and too uh, much. Uh, so final question on my side, I need to point to another book that you have published with uh, George Friedman uh, on a different topic, one again, once again related to geopolitics, but this time it's uh, about war in space, a revolution in uh, geopolitics. Maybe my final question to you is why <laughs> did you publish this book? What is your main uh, takeaway as a teaser, of course, for our audience uh, to buy uh, this um, highly interesting book? Uh, I definitely intend to read it. Um, why war in space? Yeah, now I will talk for one hour at least. Uh, <laughs> but give me like at least four minutes, okay? Yes. Uh, you know, basically, it's uh, the, the title is a little bit treacherous uh, because it's about geopolitics of the planet Earth, but with uh, an addition of the new domain that is emerging or already has emerged and is influencing the geopolitical affairs of the planet Earth. So it's about the planet Earth. It's about the superstructure of geopolitics of planet Earth. This competition between world ocean uh, against the supercontinent over the last five hundred years, seen from the you know the eyes of the extraterrestrial uh, intelligence uh, agent, so to speak. But uh, you know we 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 we, we develop the story in the book from from the following observation: people are born on land. We live and fight and have political systems on land, but we subordinated the, the domains that are deadly to us. Sea, that we navigated sea, and then we use the benefits, money and war making from sea to impose, right? World ocean domination. We dominated air domain and you die in air. You, de you die on at the sea. You die if without equipment in the air. Then we dominated electromagnetic domain, radio transmissions and stuff, right? Then we uh, uh, entered space and also cyber. So space as a new domain, we are describing space as a new domain that will be, in my opinion, the resolving, the, 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 the final arbiter of the US-China competition because the, this domain will provide new supply chains, new value chains, new military uh, edges uh, who will be more competent in that will make a lot of money will create new economy and will be militarily too formidable and space will be also in a way a destabilizing factor because if you have capabilities in space uh, the balance of power might be quickly broken and we are just simply describing it plus we describe the future war between us and china in space in 2076 so it's all about the the geopolitical of the planet earth geopolitics of the planet Earth and the war, warfare and the transformation of the warfare, uh, the information revolution that is even more reinforced by the space domain and its features, its, uh, its physical features, right? And uh, once we have done it, and I'm finishing, um, we understood that we need also to describe something which is even higher. Uh, not only LEOs and you know MEOs where GPS or, or subtle observation satellites, we, we had to describe the Earth-Moon system because right, while writing, we discovered that the Chinese are making a move to seize this high ground. So we had to describe the topography. There are also narrow uh, choke points. There are also Malacas and Gidlar Tours and Suezes of the space that someone will want to control and someone will want to impose the rules, the Ten Commandments. And that's why Trump uh, established US Space Force with capabilities to patrol this new marketplace, mm -hmm. right? this new domain. And then it turned out that we need to describe the relation between Earth and the moon. Uh, and that's the book is all about. It's simple. So definitely another, another uh, highly Highly interesting topic uh, for all the fans of geopolitics and for those who want to learn more about the upcoming 
systemic rivalry between China and United States. Definitely, as you outlined, Russia is going to play a role. What kind of role? We don't know for sure whether they will merge activities and actions uh, with the Chinese uh, by building a lunar station, uh, exiting the International Space Station. This will create a kind of a new uh, situation for the global affairs, for sure. So by this book, uh, um, along with the other most uh, recent uh, publications by Dr. Bartosiak, I want to really extend my gratitude for staying with us for almost 90 minutes. Uh, this has been my pleasure, Valina, as you know. It has been also my pleasure, and I am definitely looking forward to discussing relevant uh, geopolitical processes uh, in the future, and also the geostrategy of Poland, but also Poland's role in European and uh, global affairs. And I thank you for your insights, for your uh, very honest and uh, open uh, answers, and for the excellent um, for the excellent discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Looking Thank forward to much. more. Thanks.